Gracious Heavenly Father, just want to thank you for allowing us to continue on in these marvelous studies that you've given us. I just ask that you would filter out all the error, all of the foolish talk, all of the, everything that's not of love, and just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve uh, at BlessedHopeForever.com. Under the supreme wisdom of the elders, we are now beginning a series of studies in the book of Revelation. The Lord tells me that we should speak the truth in love, always. And I hope that I do that. And I try to do that. I've been in studies where people are so mad at me that they curse. I remember one guy, he kicked me out of his uh, pickup beside an old uh, mountain road uh, miles from the nearest town many years ago, you know, where I, I could have encountered a, a bear with nothing but a pocket knife. This book, folks, can spark a lot of controversy, and I don't want that. In the book of Revelation, the writer is John. The, the Apostle, but the author is the Holy Spirit. I've said this just about in every book that we've studied. We always begin a book by pointing out that it's God's Word. These are not John's ideas. These are not uh, John's thoughts. Uh, it's not John's logic. This is God's Word. And so we look at it as God's Word. I thought that I would uh, I'd start out here in this study and laying out just how I how I approach this book before before I do anything else. If we confine our thinking to what I I call conservative Christianity, to use my own term, there are liberals and and there are strange ideas. You know, we're all students of the scriptures, and I don't have any i don't bear any ill will toward any brother or sister in christ that, that doesn't believe as i believe students of this book of the book of revelation basically fall into uh, two major camps at least there's the preterist view and the futurist view and i realize that there's there's liberal approaches, and there's the idea that, you know, that the the book of Revelation is really, you know, uh, nothing more than a, a, a discussion of history. But I'm not interested in that. Liberal theology has has no interest to me at all, whatsoever. So, I, I need to define preterist versus futurist. Simply put, the preterist believes that that most or, or if not all prophecy was completed or fulfilled by AD 70. And if I were to discuss the reasons uh, why that they come to that conclusion, uh, that they conclude that most Bible prophecy was completed by AD 70, we would be weeks discussing preterism, okay? With, with me trying to refute it. And I do not think that that's a proper approach uh, to the book of Revelation or, or the what, where I should start here in this. So uh, that makes me a futurist. And if that is not your position on these verses, I, I think that we can still remain friends. In Titus, we read, teaching us that denying ungodliness to look for the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior. Now, if, if that was fulfilled in A.D. 70, well, then what the Holy Spirit wrote in Titus was only really good for a few years, and it doesn't apply to us because the, uh, the appearing has already occurred. These things, these things don't bother me. The major 
external evidence for the book of Revelation is a late date, not an early date, which the preterist view holds. And the way to get around that is to spend chapters refuting the early evidence. And then once you've convinced people that the early evidence is, is no good, then you, well, then you can ignore it. However, if you out there, if any of you are a preterist, that's fine. I love you dearly in the Lord, and I think we're both redeemed, and I think we'll both be in heaven. So I don't want to start any arguments here. We've got a long way to go through this book. So I've said enough, I think, by way of introduction to say that at least this approach to the book of Revelation is going to be, my, my approach is going to be futurist. And it's, it's going to be as literal as I can possibly take it. I don't have any reason in my mind to not take literal what God says unless God tells me uh, that it isn't literal. So, we begin the book. Verse 1, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto Him to show unto His servants things which must shortly come to pass. And He sent and signified it by His angel unto His servant, John. Okay, so we've got Jesus Christ, and we've got God, and we've got a messenger. Uh, we have an angel. It's a revelation, but it's Jesus Christ, subjective genitive. It isn't, it isn't a revelation about Jesus Christ. So as you go through this book, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's His re revelation that, that the Father, God, gave to Him to show unto His servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And He sent and signified it by His angel unto His servant. John. The word shortly there in the text is the word uh, Takos, which means that it won't be very long until these things happen. And, and that is, that's, of course, you know, that's really that's key to the preterist position, that it wasn't very long until A.D. 70. And I don't think that you can do that with that word. I don't believe that that's what uh, that word means. It doesn't mean that it's that it's near, that it's about to happen. The word means in a hurry in the Greek. These things are going to happen in a hurry. Whenever they start to happen, it's going to be in a hurry. You know, it won't be, it won't be more than one generation. It isn't something that's, that's, that's going to be prolonged. In fact, the Greek word, the lexical evidence for the common meaning of the word is quickly. Quickly. Those things which are going to happen, happen quickly whenever they happen. That's what I want you to see. And he sent and he signified it. And this is a Greek word which is really bandied about. Uh, you know, I was, I was taught many, many years ago before I ever studied Greek, you know, that the word meant uh, made, made known by signs and symbols. And, and we can use that then to symbolize much of the book of Revelation. But, but in fact, that is what the word implies. Uh, so there is, I believe there's some lexical support for that. The lexicons clearly say to make something known, to open it up, to reveal it, to display it. Okay? I believe it's to confirm it, to make sure it's known. It's a confirmation, so to speak. And so he sent and he made it known by his messenger, the word angelion there, unto his servant John. 
And I've already pointed out that I believe without question that John uh, is John the Apostle. Now, there are those who look at the book of Revelation and, and compare its, its Greek with uh, the Greek of the Gospel of John. And, and what they say is they, uh, they'll state that, that well, clearly he, he wrote the book of Revelation before he wrote the Gospel of John. Therefore, this is an early indication for an early date for you know the book of Revelation, uh, which tends to support the preterist view. You know, because John obviously learned a lot of Greek, you know, by the time he finished you know, the book of Revelation, and then he wrote the uh, Gospel of John. Uh, you know, the Greek in the Gospel of John is beautiful Greek. Uh, the, the Greek in the book of Revelation is fabulous. Okay? Fabulous Greek. I mean, these are beautiful words. Actually, if we look at, at references to the Old Testament, there are, there are actually 22 chapters in this book that we're about to, to get into, dive into here, and, and uh, reference, uh, the references to Old Testament passages occur over 400 times. That's over 20 times per chapter, folks. Okay? It has a lot to say to the Jews here. It's not true of, of any other book in the Bible. This is the book that completes God's circle from, from Genesis to Revelation. What began in Genesis is finished in the book of Re Revelation. Not only that, but, you know, but in my opinion, and, I, and you don't have to agree with me on anything here, but that alone is a key indicator that God is now dealing with Israel much more heavily than He is the church. It's a, it's a clear indicator that it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, the beautiful language. I think that there are those who don't believe you know, uh, that. You know, all Scripture, folks, is for us, but not all Scripture was written to us. Epistle to the Hebrews. Okay, we're not Hebrews. So I expect that you'll see that we, the church, for the most part, okay, are not given precedence in this book, even though we're there. But that doesn't mean that we're not referenced in these chapters, that there's not application there for us, that, that it's not speaking to us as well. But it's heavily Jewish. And it's God's Word. It's the revelation of Christ to John. And how should I handle God's Word? Well, if you follow this channel, you know my answer to that. I've said this many times in videos. You do not have a privilege that comes anywhere near to comparing with the privilege and the honor that you have to hold in your hands this book. I'm not talking about just Revelation, but the whole Bible. Those who profess to know God and love Him spend little time in this book. And, and since I doubt Jesus only meant it for John, the only difference as far as we are concerned is how it came. It came to John through an angel, a messenger. It came to us through Jesus as well. I want to say something a little more about the messenger at the end of this video. It just came through a different means. So I'm not interested in anybody's testimony about how God spoke to them personally when John himself received the revelation of Jesus Christ through an angel that he sent, a messenger that he sent. No further revelation has been given to God's people today. Just the very end of the book, the last book of the Bible, Revelation confirms that. None. That's why we should spend time in His Word. He doesn't reveal something special to a select few that the rest of us are deprived of. You know, and o o Oklahoma games... May OU games may last a couple of hours, but to spend two or three hours in serious and deep Bible study is really unusual. 
I don't want to be called a heretic, but I believe that the Word of God is more important than an OU football game. And, and, if, that, and if that makes you mad, if you, find, if you find that offensive, well, you might, you might need a different pastor. I count it as one of the greatest privileges of my life to spend time in a book that I know to be God's Word. And, it, and folks, it does not embarrass me one, one iota in the least that the sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth could write something that I don't understand. Einstein did that. John bore record of God's Word. Once again, it's a subjective genitive. It's, it's not a word about God. It's God's Word and of Christ's testimony. That's what this book is. It's a record of God's Word and Christ's testimony. And blessed is, fortunate is the word there in the, in the Greek, fortunate is the one that reads and those that hear the words of this prophecy and keep them. That, that's one class of people, okay? They do both. Those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And I believe that means that it should be watched for in whatever generation that's reading it. In their time as well as in the time of any other. It is, it is thought this book is the only book that promises a special blessing. I know you've heard that. Folks, I don't think that's what that means. And this, this may cause a few of you to disagree with me here, but... but because, and the reason I say that is because that is true of all of Scripture, not just the book of Revelation. Are we not blessed when we read and, and hear and obey the words of Ephesians? And we'll begin to see this develop as we go through the book of Revelation. It says here that the time is at hand. Okay? And John is to write to the seven churches the seven churches which are in Asia. And as I've already pointed out, there's no reason to believe that they aren't there. You know, it, it doesn't say, you know, he's going to write the, the seven churches that ought, ought to be there or will be there or should be there or I hope they're there, you know. There, there, are, there were churches that were there when he writes. If you go down to verse 10 of chapter 1 here, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And without doubt, the popular opinion is, today is that, well, the, you know, Steve, the Lord's day is Sunday. You know? So, you know, if you watch football on the Lord's Day, or if you play football, you know, you're going to go to hell. You know, never mind the fact that there's, you know, without doubt that there are, is, is bound to be at least a few Christians on those football teams. But n never is Sunday called the Lord's Day. You cannot show me a single passage of Scripture that calls Sunday the Lord's Day. Okay? Doesn't exist. In fact, if you, if you search history, the first time you'll ever find it is after 400 A.D. It's always the first day of the week, but, but the day of the Lord here is something particular in the Old Testament. It's not talking about the Sabbath. Okay? All right? This book is essentially about the Lord's day. So what we're going to see in the rest of this book is the Lord's Day. Over 90 references in the Old Testament to that being a specific period the beginning with the Tribulation going all the way through the Millennium. And if it concluded at AD 70, well then we've got lots and lots of problems. We've got lots of, of prophecy that we either have to, to just toss out, do away with, or we've got to spiritualize it to, to an unbelievable extent. 
John is given what God wants him to know and wants him to reveal that starts at the Lord's day. Okay? Now, I recognize that if we go through these churches in chapter 2, that there are uh, any number of people that, that put a historical concept on these seven letters. I personally believe that the Holy Spirit has moved John forward to the Lord's day, revealing that, that, that those seven letters to those seven churches represent the condition of the church when Jesus Christ returns. All seven, okay? That whenever the Lord comes to gather us together to meet Him in the air, you know, what we're so anxiously looking forward to, the rapture where we're caught up in clouds to be with Him, where we'll be forever with the Lord, that's what the church is going to look like when that event occurs. Read the seven letters. Not just the last one, not just Laodicea, but all of them. That's what the church is going to look like. And so folks say, you know, look at the condition of the church. You know, it really got bad in the dark ages. You know, well, now it's really, really bad. We're living in the age of, of, of the church of Laodicea, and it goes on and on and on. Well, I don't think we're looking at any historical presentation of, of what uh, church history looks like okay, for nearly 2,000 years now. But that we're looking at, what we will be looking at is the condition of Christ's church when He returns. They aren't, that there's, there, they aren't individual differences, but they are the characteristics of the church when Jesus Christ returns. And, and this expression, the Lord's day, it is an Old Testament expression. We see it in the book of Hebrews. We see it in the book of Isaiah. So our vantage point in this book is, is the day of the Lord and things are going to happen quickly. When they begin, they're going to happen quickly. And, and I just want to admit up front that, that my approach to this book will be that of a futurist, not the preterist view, which shouldn't really shock many of you. So let me just say a little bit of something. This is just for you to think about. I'm going to throw this out there. It's just a little something for you to think about. The word messenger, angel, which uh, uh, agelion in the Greek, the word, the word literally means messenger angel means a messenger now if you study the word you what you'll find out is, is that there are human messengers as well as celestial messengers depending on uh, the context usually you can d differentiate between the two but both are used that's my point i want you to take note uh, of the fact that when we do get into these letters concerning the churches it's to the angel of the church uh, at Ephesus, right, and so on and so forth. When you get down to Laodicea, it's to the angel of the church at Laodicea, okay? It is, it is very difficult to in, inject into that context the idea of a celestial angel. Okay. The word means messenger. The messenger, angel can be human as well as divine or celestial. Physical as well as, well as spiritual. That's my point. Okay. In fact, in Laodicea, when 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 Jesus says that I wish that uh, that you were either cold or hot. Uh, uh, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the angel at the church at Laodicea. He's talking to the messenger. Okay? It is the message that he spews out of his mouth. Christ will never spew you out of your mouth, out of his mouth, 
Okay, you can write that down for a fact and, and pin it to your fridge. No, he's writing to churches, okay? There's, there's, he's not going to spew some group of believers associated with the characteristics involved in the church of Laodicea out of his mouth. He's not going to spew them out of his mouth. Eternal life. We have eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. He will never leave us nor forsake us. It's the message that he, that he spews out of his mouth. To the angel of the messenger of the church I write. That's my point. And it would not surprise me any at all whatsoever that because we have the word signify in the text here that in order to demonstrate or prove or validate or confirm to the Apostle John what was the revelation that was given him that the angel that appeared, the messenger that appeared was, well, he's obviously he wasn't human. I do not believe he was human, but I believe that he was celestial, but I don't believe, and this is what I'm getting at, I've been driving at here, I do not believe that that necessarily means that it was a celestial angel that was created before Adam, before man. Okay? An angel such as Gabriel, or you name it. I don't believe that. Now, I do understand that Gabriel appeared to Zacharias. He appeared to Elizabeth. He appeared to uh, Joseph. He, in a, he appeared to Mary. Uh, that He appeared to Daniel. Okay? There's a lot of support for that. But I do not see... The, the fact of the matter is the angel here, is, his name has not been revealed. Okay? It wouldn't surprise me any. If, if what we're, we were not looking at here, and it's just something I, and I can't, I don't have hard scripture to back that up, but it's just something for you to think about. It wouldn't surprise me at all if it was Peter that appeared to John to confirm, to verify, to clarify, to signify, to prove, to validate the revelation that Christ was given, giving him, that was given John. Because uh, we're looking at, uh, and if you follow this channel, you know, you, you probably know at least a little bit about uh, my position concerning uh, time versus eternity. You know, we're looking at a time here in Revelation in which uh, we've basically entered into a very unique uh, period of time in human history. Um, the, uh, the rapture, okay, for the most part. Is, is has already occurred. Uh, I don't believe that we see the rapture in the book of Revelation. I believe that the 24 elders before the throne represent the church. It wouldn't surprise me if it was Peter. But uh, what, what we can know for certain is above all else, is that we have a long, long way to go to get to the end of, book, of the book of Revelation. And it, and it could very well be that we are uh, not here before I get finished going through the book of Revelation with you people. I find the timing interesting, um, given everything that's going on. It... Uh, I don't believe in accidents. I don't believe in coincidences. Uh, it, it never even entered my mind. It, it never it never occurred to me to get involved in a deep study through through the entire book of Revelation uh, in uh, November of 2020. But here we are. And uh, I said that that's what I would do. It was recommended that I do that uh, uh, I've asked for prayers concerning the direction of the ministry. This is where we're at. This is where we're going. I believe that the decision was made. I believe that it was the right one. Uh, it wasn't just me that made it. Uh, it's based on other view, uh, the view, viewer's interests. And so I, I hope that you will go with us on this journey through this amazing book. And know that I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thank you for everything, and thanks for watching.